Okay. So what would the topic is ancient Greece and the invention of Western thought. So I'm taking an angle to the topic of ancient Greece, which could have been done from several other angles, but you'll see where I'm going with this. There's going to be six sessions. Uh, the first session today, we're going to we're going to explain what the class is going to be about, and then we're going to start with a very early dive, as early as the Indo-European migrations, and and proceed through the Archaic period to Homer, and we'll touch on issues and topics like tribalism, oral poetry, and myth, which will be common themes through the course. Actually, uh, the second session. I've called the invention of rationalism, Homer to pre-Socratic philosophy. And it's going to look at a series. It's going to look at Homer a bit. We'll look a little bit at him today and a bit more next week. And selections from early philosophers who were making primitive uh, attempts to hammer out a new language and a new way of looking at the world. And, and like I warned earlier, the readings will seem um, oddly one-sided and not philosophical uh, in our larger sense of it. It's only because in the modern world, we've inherited a full curriculum and a way of talking about and thinking about issues that they were only struggling uh, to invent, actually. So I call it the invention of rationalism. The third session, I with the long name, The Invention of History and the Birth of Tragedy, is going to look at Herodotus and the Golden Age of Athens in which the great tragedians, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, had their heyday. And we'll talk quite a bit about them and how that evolved out of the same tradition, Homer and the epic poets that Herodotus uh, grew out of. And then come the big three, the last three sessions, three of uh, the largest thinkers the West ever produced, Thucydides, or Thucydides, as the Greeks would have it, and his history of the Peloponnesian War, which we're going to look at extensive excerpts from. And it's history as the study of human nature, because Thucydides is going to create the framework that Plato has to respond to. Thucydides is going to open questions and what he examines, questions about justice and, and human nature in its darkest moments that Plato is going to aggressively respond to. And the fifth session is the great man himself, uh, Plato and, and the sophists. That sounds like a do-up group, I guess. Um, Philosophy, justice, and the soul. The sophists were a class of professional teachers that Plato sets up as a series of straw men for his character Socrates to argue with. And, and we'll see what they argue about when we get there. And all the selections from Plato are from Republic, which is uh, arguably the most important book ever written. So I'll go on record. It's certainly uh, one of my uh, two or three favorite books of all time. One of the others being Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War. And then the last session, uh, the great synthesis, Aristotle and the Western curriculum, how, how Aristotle formulates a, a way of a taxonomy of study, of scientific study, humanity study, political theory study, art and aesthetic study that becomes the educational system of Western civilization, uh, which is why these guys are important for our purposes. So with that said, the main focus of the class is a transformation that took place between the 8th century and 4th centuries BCE. So roughly 750 to 350, or call it 330 when Alexander the Great comes to power. So in those four centuries, a transition has been completed that I've depicted here in this box 
as having uh, three rungs, if you will. They're, it's all part of the same thing, but there's three different dynamic aspects to the transition. One is the movement from tribal organization to political organization. The structure of social life will change in the four centuries that we're looking at. And on the side of the tribe, which we normally associate with uh, social homogeneity, uh, we are all the same people. The word for human in several tribal languages is the name of the tribe. To be human is to be one of us. They, you know, they, they don't have cultural diversity. What they have is cultural uniformity. And, and with heavy identification with the, of the individual with the tribe. My good and the tribe's good are one and the same thing. The movement towards from that sensibility towards a political style of organization sensibility, which, which really is socially heterogeneous, it's culturally complex, and the identification is frequently not with the tribe as a whole, but with a political class within the tribe. So it's completely a different way of organizing the world, and it's the modern way of organizing the world, and we'll see it happen in the period uh, we're studying. Simultaneously during this period, as part of the change, and by the way, one, one of the questions that's open to us is, are, are these things that I'm going to be talking about causes or results? Are they effects or are they, are, are they triggers? But one of the other dimensions is the movement from oral communication and the oral transmission of intellectual content and artistic content to literary transmission of content. The movement from oral epic poetry on one side to prose, history, science, philosophy, discursive documents intended for reading, as opposed to formulaic narratives that were intended for singing when, when the tradition had been oral. Simultaneous to those two changes is uh, the content itself, the movement from a mythic explanation of the world to an analytic explanation of the world. In a mythic world, we're going to see that, that the universe is explained religiously. There's a religious cosmogony that explains where the world came from. Uh, the thinking is concrete. There are gods in things. Animism, this is how things move. This is why things, certain things have power. This is what gives life to certain things. And a world, the mythic world, populated uh, by gods, demigods, and heroes. And, we, and that movement is going to be towards one of rationalist explanation, abstract thought processes, and science, history, and philosophy evolving as, as traditions for explanation. So the whole, the, the method of explanation, the language of explanation, and the underlying social organization that supports all of this all of this is part of the single transition that we're going to be talking about. And along the way, I hope to be able um, to help you answer the questions, why the Greeks, why at this point in history, what were the dry, driving forces, and finally, what was the historical impact that, that resulted uh, from all of this. That having been said, uh, let us go way back to the beginning. So let's start our, our story as early as uh, the European prehistory and the emergence of Europeans. Now, you know, people had been in Europe, including the Neanderthals, arguably as early as 100,000 BC. Um, 
certainly humans had made it into Europe out of Africa and out of the Near East, Africa being the source of all humanity, ultimately, um, by 40,000 BC. But for the next 35,000 years, the only way we can study uh, occurrences or learn anything about the societies or cultures that live there was by looking at very primitive physical surviving elements. And that's looking at, you know, carved warheads and carved stone and, and, and things like pottery when you get into the later period. Uh, but now most recently genetic studies, DNA studies, when we can find bones that still yield viable DNA, uh, we're able to tell something about migratory patterns and the like. Uh, all of this traditional archaeology, enhanced DNA studies, the picture we get is that there are layers of migrations into Europe since the end of the last ice age, and which would have ended, give or take 500 years, around 11,000 BCE. The latest theories uh, argue for three source populations. There were hunter-gatherers that were in place uh, already, left over from the early humans. Uh, and by the way, a comment on the Ice Age. One of the reasons that the DNA variation outside of Africa is narrower than the DNA variation in Africa is because the population of humans outside of Africa was demolished by this, the Ice Age. And there are some archeologists who argue that the human population at the end of the Ice Age, so going back from us, going back like 12, 13,000 years, uh, may have only been 10,000 people. So everyone from Native Americans to modern Asians, to Europeans and South Americans who are not the recent immigrants from Africa, um, have closer DNA linkages than peoples within Africa proper. That being said, that's one of the many richest sides that I hope to be able to drop here and there. The other two sources of population coming into Europe were farmers from the Near East where uh, grain was first domesticated about 10,000 BC, uh, which by the way is going to explain why the populations of Asia Minor were so much greater than anywhere else and could support imperial structures, which I'll be talking about in a slide or two. It's because domestic grain can support much larger populations than uh, either hunting and gathering or pastoralism, herding animals and moving nomadically over land, like most of the Indo-Europeans, which will explain, by the way, when, when, if, when we study like the late Roman period and people say, oh, the German hordes penetrated the empire, the German hordes were outnumbered by the Romans by a factor of, you know, like a hundred to one, given the fact that they, they were an, an agrarian society, but not our time or place right now. And, and the th third wave were pastoralists from the European steppe. So if we look at that steppe hypothesis, for instance, the Yamnaya uh, culture, as it's called, uh, which is a name given to the so-called pit grave. It's a burial. Often these cultures, if they can't be named for pottery, they're gonna be named for the way they buried or took care of their dead because we don't have many other artifacts left over. So the Yamnaya were the pit grave culture and, and the mound people, it's like the mound people in England uh, were probably Yamnaya who got there. So five, 6,000 years ago, they're moving into uh, Northern Europe, There's, they become the so-called corded ware culture, late Neolithic. So this is 3000 to 4000 BC. And they're called corded ware. I, I threw that little picture of a pot 
that's in fairly good shape. And you can see the corded decoration along the, uh, the wide rim, and that's why it's called corded ware. The farmers may have made it up into uh, Europe and spread mainly through Southern Europe uh, eight or 9,000 years ago. Uh, and so these, these populations mingle. So when some of these uh, later Indo-Europeans, offshoots of the earlier Yamnaya, migrate into Europe and down into Greece and down into Italy and down into Spain and across France and ultimately uh, to the British Isles, they would have found people in place who had mastered uh, plant domestication already. And, and, and the Greeks would often refer to populations that they found in place as Pelasgians or Palas the Palaskoi, as they would have called them. Um, so the, there were people, they're not the, the first people to arrive on the scene. The Indo-Europeans begin to move in as early as call it 3000 uh, BC or so. They, the, the homeland, you know, they're herders, they come with horses, they, they come with oxen, um, I believe they come with sheep at the same time. And, and they move in several directions, the Tocharians into Northern Asia, the Aryans into India, Medes, Persians are a later, uh, slightly later movement, that darker red is an earlier movement. The Mitanni who come into the heartland of Asia Minor where they meet up with Semitic peoples like the Assyrians and Akkadians and Hebrews, moving up out of the Arabian Peninsula. They are not Indo-European and the basis of their languages, languages are different. But some Assyrians uh, or some people who will become Assyrian are Indo-European. So Assyrians form out of a kind of merger culture. But to our purpose, the people that we come to think of as Greeks, some of them stop in Thrace, the Thrake, as the Greeks would have called them. Some make it in a series of movements. You see, some of the movements are dark red in summer, that lighter brownish color. They, they come over about a thousand years. And, uh, oh, somebody asked the question, will the slide deck become available? Yes, it will. I send the whole slide deck out and the whole thing goes online as well. You'll get everything. Um, the same time that the Greeks were coming into Greece, or people, they, didn't, they didn't call themselves Greeks, which is actually a Latin word. They, they didn't even think of themselves as the same people. There were different tribes. But the people who form what we and settle what we will call Greece um, began to come down in the period 3000 to 2000 BCE, some a little later. Around the same time that Illyrian groups were settling what we would think of as places like Croatia uh, and Slovenia, Italics, a, a group of loosely related Indo-Europeans uh, who speak Italic related languages. These languages are not close enough so that one would have been able to, Latins would not have been able to understand the Im Umbrii, the, the ancient Umbrians or the Liguri, the ancient Ligurians and the like. Just as there were Celts of many different stamps moving uh, into uh, England to become the Britons, moving into Spain, moving into France, Baltz headed up north. There, there were uh, that very different language group, the Finns in the way north. And you'll see uh, Germans move in. And this is why all, by the way, your Indo-European languages have common language roots. So this is why the Celts and, and the Romance languages and the German languages and the Greek languages all have uh, lots of words and, and many Indian languages. Sanskrit has much in common. There would have been an Ur Indo-European language that linguists have tracked back and, and know quite a bit about actually. 
Uh, so you'll notice, though, that in the Nile Delta, along some spots of the coast of modern Turkey, and in the Tigris and you, the, the so-called Fertile Crescent, there were settled urban cultures because agriculture had given them the opportunity to stay in place and to build population centers of uh, scale and significance. And we will be talking about that in a slide or two. Now, a general timeline of the early part of this period. So we have the early Bronze Age, bronze being an amalgam metal. So that means copper was being mined. The so-called Chalcolithic discovery period was 3,500 BC to 3,000 BC. And in the early Bronze Age, there was the settlement of the Greek islands. They were more advanced than mainland Greece. Uh, we can find agricultural practice in place, metalwork, herding. There are advanced urban societies in the Near East, Assyria, Sumer, and of course, Egypt and, and Northeastern Africa. And there was writing for bookkeeping and ritual purposes. It's not literary writing, but it's marking for record keeping purposes. The Minoan civilization on Greece, which there's strong evidence of as early as 2600 BC and following, it's non-Greek in the early period, but it becomes Greek after the incursions of several tribes and a mixing of populations. They have an alphabet, linear A, uh, but Minoan civilization seems to, after a thousand years, gets totally eclipsed around 1400, 14 to 1500 BCE. It may have been a volcano or an earthquake helping the catastrophe along. There is on the Greek mainland, actually it's on the Peloponnese, Mycenae or Mycenae. Uh, they're Greek and there are other Indo-Europeans, Hittites, Italics, Celts, all arriving in about the same time, 2200 to 2000 or 1800. Mycenaean civilization has a lot of petty states with high kings. These, by the way, it's this civilization that is going to get lionized in the Iliad and the Odyssey. These are the people Homer is actually writing about. He's, the Iliad is, is about a Mycenaean, God knows, it, it, it might have been a, just a sea raid, but, but it's lionized as if it were World War III, of course. Uh, Greek settlers uh, had moved to Crete by this point. A new alphabet, linear B, is on the scene. And this civilization collapses in the period between 1200 and 1100 BCE. Um, we know there's some new migrations, the so-called Dorians, and it precipitates a dark age, the so-called Greek dark ages, which result in a cultural collapse and political fragmentation. And out of this collapse, the seeds for the classical period, the, the period of the collapse is called the archaic period. Out of this is going to grow all of the elements that we're going to be talking about. And it may have been because of social conditions precipitated by this collapse. So, Let's begin to talk about it a bit. One of the first uh, topics I want to stress is that all through this period, while we're going to be looking at the Greek world fairly closely, to the south and to the east are civilizations that by a broad range of measures are much, they're certainly much larger, but they're much more successful than the Greek experiment. They're richer, uh, they build urban areas of scale, 
They've mastered uh, large plantation farming and can, and can support uh, massive populations. You know, classical Athens might have at its height never been more than 80,000 people. But in Babylonian culture, in, in Assyrian culture, the, the, the scale of the populations was much more significant. There was agriculture and urbanization of an intense character along the Nile and between the Tigris and Euphrates River, so-called Mesopotamia, between the rivers, using the Greek phrase, uh, modern Iraq, if you will. And in, in Egypt, and, and these were large-scale centers of civilization that because of their scale were very hierarchical in nature with a terrific amount of social stratification. And back in the 50s, 1950s, uh, a historian by the name of Carl Wittfogel uh, popularized the term, which is much out of fashion now, but it it's useful to explain something about these civilizations. He used the phrase oriental despotism to create what he called, the impression of what he called hydraulic societies, command structures, imperial societies with powerful hierarchies uh, and top-down imperial structures, which the Greeks were well acquainted with because much of uh, the most advanced Greek centers were cities on the coast of Turkey that were under the rule, paying tribute to whichever empire at the time was dominating the Fertile Crescent. So the Greek world was quite, even before the Persian Wars, was quite familiar with the culture and civilizations of, of these imperial centers. And, and for the Greeks, it was a, uh, a sign of their differentness. The Greeks referred to them as barbarians, uh, barbaroi, but the word meant alien, different. It didn't mean uh, less civilized. In fact, probably more civilized. It would, it would have been, you know, farm boys from Iowa going off to Paris in 1917. How are you going to keep them down on the farm once that they've seen Paris? So despite this, cultural advances in writing, astronomy, and art were highly respected by the Greek world. And, and there were tremendous advances in astronomy, art, and, and agriculture, um, and in writing, not literary writing, but uses of alphabet and the like in this part of the world. It was a palace society. There were these centers where whoever was ruling uh, the polyglot groups that inhabited the region, speaking many languages and being of many ethnicities, it was very multicultural. The there would be palaces for the moving army. Uh, the, 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 the king and his entourage to process and, and collect tribute from one place to the other. So the succession of political overlords in the palaces rested on this, this fruitful agricultural activity that never is destroyed by new empires coming in. Mainly, somebody comes in and takes over the top slots and the social pecking order, but the lower classes, the folks down on the farm with their many languages and many different cultural ethnicities stay in place. So it was this polyglot world. And it, of course, it is this polyglot world that um, you get in the book of Genesis in the story of the Tower of Babel. And here is in this image on the lower right is the hanging uh, gardens of Babylon with the Tower of Babel off in the distance. And you remember the biblical story. Uh, they're presumptuous, these people who think they're so powerful that they can build a, a tower that extends to heaven and challenge Yahweh, the God, our God, the only God. And, and he will curse them with 
multiple languages so that they won't be able to speak to each other and their empire will fall apart. So a simple biblical story for a complex social idea. Uh, four maps just to create an impression, not to give you um, specific orientation so much, but always in the Egypt to Mesopotamia arc, you're going to find from as early as 3200 BC, you're all the way down to when the Greeks are fighting the Persians in 480 BC. So, so virtually 3000 years, not quite 2700 years later, there's always going to be a major player or major players to the south of the Greeks and to the east of the Greeks. And it's a world that they think of as a world of advanced civilizations. Not their world, very different from their world, but it's out there. They learn from it and they respect it. So we, here we have the Sumerian and Akkadian empire, Sumer in the orange, um, the Akkadian in that green. This is in the upper left. The Assyrians in two different periods uh, in the ninth century BC and all the way down into the seventh century. Babylonians, here I'll expand this map for a second. And that red trail is the line of the captive Israelites in captivity being taken to Babylon, whatever number Psalm that is, but by the river in Babylon, uh, the Va Pensiero of uh, in Nabucodonosor, Nabucco, the opera, when the, the chorus sings the sad song remembering the lost homeland, the Israelites sing, uh, fly my thought back to home. And of course, the Persian Empire, which the Greeks were well acquainted with because they have to, to, to move to a period of their own create, creative dominance. These are the folks they've got to fight. And, and the Persians, as early as the 550s, uh, are on the scene under the great king Cyrus and Darius and then Xerxes later on, people we will be looking at. So that Bronze Age collapse that we talked about, uh, allegedly initiated by a group that is known in the Bronze Age as the Sea Peoples, there's still a lot of conjecture uh, about who these folks were. They could have been Greeks, they could have been Philistines, who themselves could have been Greek. They could have been Central European Slavic marauders, uh, it could have been a Mycenaean civil war. No one is quite sure what happened, but there were people who came in ships like Vikings and created havoc. The consequences were that the Hittite state, uh, themselves an Indo-European group, and the Mycenaean empire and the Peloponnese, uh, the world of Agamemnon and, and the Iliad, uh, politically collapse. Egypt and Assyria are seriously weakened and the Greek world enters the so-called dark ages. There's a loss of population. There's a loss of commerce. Phoenicians who come from the area of modern Lebanon, here's Tyre here, they, they will, and, and one of the next slides is going to show it, they are going to rival the Greeks for re-establishing commerce in the Mediterranean. There's the loss of alphabet during this period. Linear, linear B script is gone. But in the eighth century, in the nick of time, an alphabet will be imported from Phoenicia. Um, so a, a Near Eastern alphabet will get imported and it becomes the foundation of the Greek alphabet. Uh, the heroic age kingship model, most of the Greek centers were ruled by kings. Uh, 
declines and the palace culture goes with it. You can still go to Mycenae and in, in, in the Peloponnese and you see the great lion gate of Mycenae that you can walk through the palace gate. And there is a tremendous amount of decentralization. So there's the localization of tribal groups and household groups called oikoi. And, and not just decentralization, since, since the palace cultures collapse, what you're left with is a lot of small scale agriculture and sea trading towns um, near the coast always on islands or near the coast. And, and they tend, you get remnants of different tribal and linguistic groups in these Greek towns settling in with each other. So you begin to build the foundations of what they will call the polis, the, the, the small city that becomes the hallmark and of uh, the Greek world and probably the single most important social development for the sake of the emerging uh, cultural transition that we were describing at the, as of the first slide of the class. This, the period right before this collapse, the Greek cultural memory uh, will idealize it as the golden age. Um, it was it was considered you know the, the world of great men in those days heroes and gods walked the earth anyhow in this archaic period and here we have it 800 480 BCE it's the rise of the new political structure the polis the word for city in Greek from which we get political and you can see this map down here, the, the areas that were most amenable to the new developments were the areas around Attica where Athens is, and with it spread to the islands and the coast of Asia Minor, the coast of Turkey, uh, all the way from Mytilene down to uh, Halicarnassus and Rhodes. And, the deeper country areas stayed more tribal. By the way, when we get to looking at the Peloponnesian War between the Athenian and Spartan federations, what we'll see is that the Athenians will become the leading, Athens will become the, the, the leading promulgator of this small town sea power trading society built around the polis and Sparta will become the spokes, uh, the leading spokesperson for the still more traditionally uh, arranged tribal organization of the Greek world, even though that the polis will come to be a player across the entire Greek world ultimately. So after the collapse of the tribal kingdoms, a new community model begins to emerge in the coastal sea trading fringe. And it's the independent city-state. The mountainous region of central Greece still supported traditional tribal organization, but harbors, inlets, and islands of coastal Greece were the occasion for small autonomous groupings built around sea trade. On the um, west side, of the Peloponnese, like the Mane Peninsula down here. Uh, the mountains are so treacherous that in World War II, the, the German army did not penetrate to find uh, the rebel groups that were still living in those mountains. That's how daunting the Western side of, of the Greek mountain regions can be. Anyhow, by the sixth century BC, so in the 500s, Multiple Poleus, that's the plural, dotted the coasts of Greece, Asia Minor, Sicily, and Southern Italy. I, the next slide, I got a map that I'll show you. Southern Italy. The reliance on fishing and sea trade limited the optimal size of a city. You're not going to have a city of 300,000 based on uh, fishing and, and, and 
small scale sea trade. And I'm going to suggest that the development of like the democratic model out of small town groupings of senior citizens, not in the sense of old, but more important, uh, the more important senior citizens coming together as representatives of family groups and, and tribal groups and the like to debate courses of action and to plot out the next moves that this kind of New England town hall culture that grows out of these polays might have had a lot to do with the development of the kind of independent thinking that would support new alternatives of explanation and new technologies like literacy. Anyhow, we'll, we'll get there. This is gonna be a, a topic high and central to our concerns all the way through. There's a lot of colonization that takes place in this period, mainly because in these small towns, as happens everywhere, anytime the population in a successful period begins to build a little bit, there's social and economic strains. There is class struggle, even in these little places. And so the way the Greeks found to relieve the pressure, literally they were very conscious of this, as a pressure reliever, they would, they would say to second sons who can't inherit the family farm or the, you know, the family tuna uh, shipping business, they would say, okay, younger sons, go off to another island, go off to Sicily, go off to uh, modern Puglia in Italy and, and start another town. So this, in the absence, as I say in this bottom paragraph there, in the absence of kings, the cities organize themselves in different formats. The Athenian model of democracy, the demos means the group, the mob, if you will, often resulted in class disparities. And, and anybody who could, by the way, since it was a group vote often, anybody who could captured the imagination of the largest number of votes in the group, a demagogue, if you will, we know what that is, don't we, um, could wind up initiating a period of tyranny. So it was well known to Plato and Aristotle that one of the greatest dangers of a democracy is that it is fertile ground for spilling into uh, a tyranny in which a, a strong man uh, gets voted in. You start off with the uh, Vermont Town Hall and you wind up with Vladimir Putin. Uh, Spartan, the Spartan state organization, however, was a military oligarchy up with, which enacted severe discipline it was much less chaotic. It still was subject to certain social strains, but it, it was kind of top heavy, heavy uh, sort of like a, organizing the town as a military camp. We'll speak to that as we get on a bit. Uh, it's time for a cartoon. So what we have here is this abstract picture of a small polis and what was central to it. Uh, there's the Acropolis and temples up on the, on the heights. We, and there always is an, an Acropolis, a high town closer to the gods. So this is where you would put the, the temples. An Agora, a square down here for doing business and trading and buying groceries and what have you. There'd be a defensive wall. There could be, a, theaters and gymnasia and, and maybe even an arena in a more advanced place later on for, for hearing uh, choral pieces and later plays. There would be a port somewhere and you're always near the port. And later on Athens, because it becomes a sea power, builds a high wall down to the Piraeus 
so that even if the farmland area is completely controlled by, as it is, the Spartan enemy during the Peloponnesian War, they can still get to their ships by, by they ex extended the walls down to meet the port. And out here are the farmland villages and little farmers the, that the Greeks refer to as the perioikoi, the families out there, the wandering groups with their little farms out in the sticks. But they bring in the cabbage and the arugula, so we have to rely on them. So it's a society in transition. Political and religious affiliations of the polis still contain remnants of tribal organization. So there still are Philae tribes, there still are fratres, clans, and there still are Genea families in the Greek world. Um, the social classes are full citizens, adult men and not all adult men, uh, medics, people who were there for trading purposes and the like, but were citizens of other places, residents of other cities, which in a place like Athens would have been a significant number, and a slave population that might have been as many as 30% uh, of the city. Uh, hard to tell, different speculation. During this period, we talked about migrations and we talked about there being multiple languages uh, that all then merge into a final Greek form I, on this note on the top of this map, I'd say Greek is now widely believed to be the product of contact between the Indo-European immigrants and, and speakers of the indigenous languages of the Balkan Peninsula. So there were people speaking whatever they were speaking when the early uh, Greeks arrived, those Indo-Europeans around 2000 BC, and there would have been a mix with of populations and languages. Dialects emerge uh, from our purposes. There is the so-called the Aeolian, which uh, the Northern Islands wind up speaking, the Achaean out here in the center of the Peloponnese. The Dorians, who are the, Sp the Spartans and Argos and Corinth, uh, who become a dominant force, found Harlequinasis, they colonize that, they colonize Rhodes. And famously, the Ionians, who are, uh, if you will, the culturally most advanced uh, group, the ones that are going to take leadership in developing some of the new ways of thinking uh, most aggressively. And they establish strong outposts in Delos and Samos and Miletus and Ephesus, etc. Going west, now we're looking at the other side. Let's look at the smaller map first. First of all, there are uh, all these italic groups that I said that were moving into the Italian boot. Uh, there were the, the Veneti, there were the Liguri, the Umbri. There, notice Latins, the, the, what becomes Roman is this tiny little sort of yellow greenish spot on the bottom end of Umbria. And on the edge of the Etruscan population, which is pre-Indo-European, which people think came from Asia Minor at some point and might have had a language that, that was similar to what was known as Lydian in Asia Minor, uh, and had a very advanced culture of their own, had a tremendous influence on the, the Latin world. In fact, early Rome was as much Etruscan as it was Latin. And, and, um, and here they are even influencing um, in the, into the islands of the Mediterranean. The Illyrians, the Dalmatian coast, uh, the Greeks had moved into uh, the toe of Calabria. They founded Naples. They were a, a very different people than the, than the Oscan language groups like the Samnites in the mountain areas of, the, of Campania. 
And to this day, um, local Southern Italians regard the people from up in Benevento and Avellino as, as, as almost ethnically distinct from themselves. They will often, Neapolitans will often characterize what they look like as, as Greco, as opposed to the people from the, uh, like my forefathers with the little snub noses up in the hills. Anyhow, and Sicily gets heavily um, populated by the Greek world. So various Italic groups, Latins, Rome, small region. Rome would begin to come into its own during the Greek golden age, the classical period. Rome would become a little shadow uh, telling the world what it will be in that period. And we'll touch on that as we go along. Punic Carthaginian culture dominated Western Sicily. Uh, they show it not in S Sicily here, uh, but in Sardinia, but it, Carthage is in the, uh, that promontory in what is, what would it be now? Would it be Libya or Tunisia? I'm not even sure. Um, and we'll talk about Punic culture as we go. The Greek, a map of Greek dialects. So you can see just from the shadings as the Greeks began to settle in Tapulia and Campania, you can see that they were coming from different source places. Some of them were coming from, so Syracuse in the Southeast becomes a major ally of Sparta during the Peloponnesian War because they were a colony of Sparta as was Akragas, Agrigento, uh, of the famous temples, of the famous Greek temples. Uh, but the Achaeans had settled near Pestum, where, which po Posidonia, as uh, the, the town of Poseidon, where the famous temples of Pestum are about 40 or 50 miles south of Naples. And Naples itself settled by uh, Ionian Greeks. And you see all the way from Taranto, uh, uh, Metaponto, I tend to use the Italian names from most of these places, Croton, uh, were being settled by, down to Reggio, were being settled by various different Greek ethnicities during uh, the colonial period of the archaic world. And if we look at the, take a high view of the Mediterranean, dark green being Greek proper, light green being uh, colonies of Greeks, including Marseille, including, um, what would Saguntum be in the modern world? Um, but you notice that the Phoenicians, all of whom come from Lebanon over here, and what would be Lebanon and Syria, um, their trading empire establishes strong roots all the way across the northern edge of Africa, uh, the southern edge of Spain, and uh, up through Barcelona, where, which is named for the family of Hannibal, uh, of, the Carth of Carthaginian fame of a couple centuries later, the Barça family, Hasdrubal, Hamilcar, and Hannibal Barça. And they will be major trade rivals. That Carthage will become a major trade rival to them, but they won't become an enemy so much because Carthage is really fighting for dominance in Spain, the Balearic Islands, Corsica and Sardinia and Sicily. And, and there they're going to run into Etruscan and, and soon Roman interests. And, and that will be the um, focus of the Carthaginian world for the most part. The Greeks, because of a general, remember these are just colonies in Italy. Their real orientation is towards Asia and Asia Minor, and the great empires that we said live over here. This is where the wealth was. 
This is where the trade was going to be. This was where they were going to look uh, for their future development. In the late archaic period, so now we're talking about, let's say, the 6th century and the 500s, lots of stuff, the 700s and 500s, lots of stuff happens. There's a cultural recovery. The Phoenician alphabet, which is northern Semitic, as I mentioned, was adopted. And Homer, Hesiod, and the so-called lyric, the nine lyric poets, Sappho, Simonides, Pindar, uh, all of those folks can be written down and transmitted uh, on tablet and, and several other media uh, for the first time. And there are tremendous advances in representational art, heavily influenced by Egyptian and Near Eastern uh, figuration. So there's sculpture, we have the uh, a famous Kuros young man, a famous the Kore, the Peplos, because she's showing her her gown. Uh, there's black and red figure vase painting, so it's black on red or red on black. So here, and, and these are from well-known artists of the sixth century. This is here. I should expand this a little bit. So we have. These are just marvelous. Achilles and Ajax playing dice. That was by the, the famous Exequias. And hoplite soldiers with Athena and Hermes, two gods supporting them from either side. Um, on Dokadi. So this would be a scene from, with Athena on one side and Hermes on the other. This would be a scene from the Iliad. Um, and down here, a very uh, primitive sacrifice scene that we have on a panel, very unusual. There aren't many of these around with some early writing on it. The famous Sphinx of, of uh, Naxos. I would um, mention along the way that the Metropolitan Museum in that wing, uh, that Greek wing, as you walk back towards the Roman, as you enter off of Fifth Avenue straight up, you know, opposite 82nd Street there, and if you go into the uh, main room and then take the left hallway, the, the Greek pottery is the collection they have is just sensational. If you're interested in looking at stuff in this period and it's, and it's such wonderful art. Anyhow, traditional religion. We were talking about this mythic world that had dominated uh, the early period. So the gods. The Greeks, by the way, didn't have a word for religion in our sense. Uh, they did use a couple of words, eusabeia, for piety, the term for having a respectful attitude towards anything that's sacred. Uh, you should be. In fact, they often named people, even to the Christian period, Eusebius becomes a, there's a saint named Eusebius, for instance, the pious one. Uh, cult a word for called treskeia, which meant ritual. And it meant ritual was a matter of getting the activities associated with something sacred correct. So you often needed priests who knew uh, the liturgy, the liturgos, the sacred, uh, the urgos, the, the, the sacred force had to be executed appropriately. There are 12 Olympians, Zeus, Hera, Poseidon, Demeter, Athena, Ares, Aphrodite, Apollo, Artemis, Hephaestus, Hermes, and then either, depending, there are different versions of it, either Hestia or Dionysus, who we'll talk a lot about later on. The final roster drew from two sources. There were uh, the Indo-Europeans brought sky gods with them, gods, uh, thunder gods, gods of weather, gods of military might, gods on horseback, gods that were, that epitomized nomadic, the nomadic warrior ethos. The other tradition, remember back to the early map, I said we had two sources of populations moving into the European region. One was the, you know, the Yamaya Indo-European source, and they came with their sky gods. 
And the people from the agricultural regions are obsessed with crop success and fertility, brought with them the so-called Catholic gods, gods of the underworld, gods that controlled fertility and rebirth and would become the foundation later on for the mystery cults, the salvation cults of the later Greek period, which we will get a chance to talk about. And so here uh, is Zeus of Smyrna, uh, a classic sky god of the first order with his thunderbolt in hand. And, and by the way, and the image next to it from the Eleusinian mystery cult uh, from Eleusis, Demeter, Tripolemus, and Persephone. Persephone, uh, Demeter is the grain goddess, and she sends her daughter is captured by Hades and taken into the underworld. And Demeter has to go and bargain with Hades um, to let her go, and he agrees to release her only for part of the year. So when she is allowed to, to come up out of hazy, Hades, we have spring and summer crop fertility, and we have the winter when she has to return. So seasonality is associated with the cult of this goddess. And indeed, as I say in this box, any force or power in nature, any dynamic, and the Greek word for force or power is dynamis, from which we get dynamic. Any force or power in nature was a god or the effect of a god. Animism, something moved, the living thing, the heartbeat, the stream that moves, it's a god that gives it its, its motif, its motivation, its force. They were often, gods were often linked to specific places around which cult ritual accrued. So there would be a god of the spring. And that god of the, of the spring might have been associated by somebody with a goddess from another spring that they knew. And, and somebody would say, oh, this is very similar to where I come from, there's a spring. And we say, that's the spring of whomever, of Athena. And they would say, ah, so this must be two. So, so this one would be the cult of Athena at this spring, and the other one would be the cult of Athena at that spring. And in one sense, they were thought of as separate goddesses, but at the same time, they were thought of as the same god or goddess. So, when a god was associated with a central myth or an established Olympian, it is said to represent an aspect of the god. So Zeus Volcanos in Crete, which is the vegetable Zeus, if you will, the, 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 the Zeus, the Zeus of vegetation, or Zeus Lycaios in Arcadia, Zeus of the wolves, of the wolves, the wolf Zeus. Um, the same is true of the Italic pantheon. The Romans, the Romans had, they had Jupiter instead of Zeus. They had Minerva uh, instead of Athena. They had Mars instead of Ares, and as did the Germans because they were, they were all descended from the same set of sky gods that the Indo-Europeans brought. So, so there was Votan or Vodin, et cetera, and Odin. Um, so these are all in effect, this, all traceable to the central um, Indo-European god set. Uh, here we have in this image in the upper right, we have the consulting of the Pythia, uh, the Oracle of Delphi, and people would go up there in this goddess at the Temple of Apollo in Delphi. If you've ever been there, this spookily holy place where you would uh, go up and make contributions to the priestesses and the like, and, and uh, the priestess would tell you 
the answer usually very cryptically in an oracle. Uh, the answer up to your question, which was often more confusing than the question itself was. Anyhow, the religion and myth. So myths have extraordinary wide range of function. The Greek word mythos, myth, it, in its literal sense, it means a tale, a legend, fable, or a story. At no point are any of these words, do they have, you know, tale, legend, fable, or story, do they have the modern bias of, oh, it's something made up or something not true. Um, stories have force. Uh, they had meaning. They, they explained reality. These myths were communicated in oral traditions. They were oral traditions of tribal communities. So back in that first slide, when I said moving from tribal organization to political, from oral communication to literary, from mythic explanation to rational. Well, the myths were the intellectual content that was the product of oral transmission by tribal societies. In their first sense, they're explanations of natural forces, pure animism. What is the power in this thing? How does this thing work? It is the God. And if you want it, to work and you want it to work repeatedly and predictably, you better appease the God correctly. They are creation stories to the very fundamental question, where did we come from? And of course, since creation took place at a time in a myth and in a time before our time, and in something that made us who we are, that place and time were sacred. It was sacred time. It was an ordinary time. And it was in a sacred place. This is why giants could walk the earth. This is why people could be larger than life. This is why they weren't like us. It was, except in the many ways in which, as we will see, they are like us in their emotional rivalries and the like. But they're creation stories. They are also authentications of ritual. Sometimes somebody comes to a place and the priests, you know, are doing whatever. They're sacrificing frogs or something. And somebody says, ah, why do they do that here? Well, sometimes the cult activity predated the myth that came to be associated as an explanation. It was lost in the midst of time. So they make up a, a story to explain why that should now be the case, that we do things this way. So cult activity was very specific to a locality, as I said in the previous slide, Apollo Helios, Apollo the sun god, versus Pythian Apollo, Apollo up, you know, the oracle consults, and took place in a sacred precinct at Temenos, so the Temenos is the precinct in and around the temple proper. Uh, and it's a sacred place. It's the place that the God sits. Supplicants made votive offerings, that is sacrifices to ensure the favor of the God. And myths were employed to explain and sanction uh, cult ritual. So, the Pan-Hellenic festivals, and there were four of them, Pan-Hellenic meaning the Greeks, by the time we get to the fifth century, the Greeks were enough of a unified society that they would send from all the cities to celebrate festivals for all of the Hellenes. Hellas is what the Greeks called themselves by this point in time. So they were the Hellenes. So Pan-Hellenic festivals for all the Greeks. There was one at Olympia, as you can well imagine, um, or uh, the, it's actually in Greek, it's pronounced Olympia, Delphi, Nemea, and Ismaia near Corinth. They were all marked by games, 
uh, celebratory games and the Olympics, if you will, the competitions. And they had been uh, ever since early in the archaic period. And choruses, sacred processions with singing, narratives that were drawn from the mythic content of, of the shared culture that evolve into Greek drama. And we're going to very explicitly talk about how that happens when we get to uh, that class, which I guess is the third class. Um, and then myths are also models for human behavior. They explain the ought. It was the educational content of the society. So narratives of the gods supply templates and prototypes for ideal human behavior. You look to Achilles, Achelios, as he's called, to get the models for courage, for enlightenment, Odysseus, enlightenment, passion, well, almost any Greek story, and piety. Uh, and they also serve as conduits for psychological and emotional expression. And in this box, and I'm going to, this is a theme that we will be coming back to uh, several times in several different contexts. Reliving myths in a communal setting where oral epic poetry is being sung provided intense experiences of inspiration and purgation. Purgation, catharsis. Um, let's see what Aristotle says about this. Myths provided the opportunity to identify with the heroism of Achilles or the ecstatic dislocation of Dionysus, for instance. Here were opportunities. This was Hollywood, folks. This was, this was um, Italian opera. This, this was Tosca. You get to identify with the best and the worst and the most profoundly passionate templates that the world can throw up in front of you so that you could become a part of it almost sacramentally and experience the, the purgation and the headiness of, of the art. So with my little red star here, religio mythic explanation assumes, and this has got to be fundamentally understood, a mystery in the world. There's a fundamental mysteriousness in the world, since the agents are gods, the agency is gods, we are essentially passive. We don't really have agency. This is why fate becomes such a dominant theme in the Greek world, the moira, the fates, the three sisters. The Norns in the, in the Germanic myths are the same thing. This is, it's, it's because those who can do things are the gods. And, we're, and we are their playthings. It's also one of the reasons why everyone is constantly warning one another in the Greek world uh, not to be prideful. Do not Ten, there might be a God listening, in which case you're putting yourselves at risk. So watch yourself. Uh, the artwork on the screen, if I can come down, we have Athena being born, full tilt from the head of Zeus. I love this version. Uh, the warrior princess comes out. And here we have Adonis and Aphrodite, uh, the gorgeous ones. This, this was even before uh, MTV. Here we have the gorgeous ones. And on the bottom, Heracles and the Minotaur. 
and those Heracles, who is not a god, but is a, a, a demigod, a, her, a hero who's partly parented by a goddess. Now, epic poetry uh, on the same theme. I've been talking about it already. And we're going to still be talking about epic poetry at the beginning of the next session uh, in detail. The Greeks developed an oral tradition of song cycles that related the exploits of gods and heroes central to the identity and values of the tribe. In the archaic period, these narratives would be sung, which I can't stress enough, by uh, someone who is titled a rhapsod, a rhapsodos, or iodos, is another word they use for him, uh, uh, from which we get rhapsod, a professional singer. And as we'll see, it's an inflected language. It, it's, it's, a, it's a rhythmic language that, that uh, having a professional for was important, who conformed to a very strict set of conventions. The basic storyline, which was drawn from the Trojan War, a late Mycenaean war party that occurred, as I said before, circa the 14th century, but included an abundance of entertaining episodes and sidebars. If you've ever read Homer, you realize every time he mentions the hero of a given city, he has to go off and include long passages about the glory of this character and the glory of his city and the people he's representing because the rhapsode is going to go to this place, wherever it happens to be. He's going to go to Mytilene or someplace in Thrace, and, he, and he's going to, to sing the story of the war, but which is 12,000 lines long. It's going to take several days to go through. But at some point, and he might not be singing the whole thing, but at some point around that little communal uh, assembly down in the local Agora, he's going to hit on the hometown boy. Tell us the story at San Francisco. Tell us the story of Joe DiMaggio, the hometown boy. It's Commerce, Oklahoma. Tell us about Mickey Mantle. Anyhow, the scale of the war always had to be vast so-called epic proportions, we even have a phrase for it. And it had to lionize the national heroes of every Greek city that participated in the war. Uh, divine intervention and emphasized the importance and the centrality of the events. All of the gods got in on this, so this had to be the most important thing that ever happened in the universe. Every significant value and mythic theme of civilization was presented in the story. Everything was presented. This was the educational text of the civilization. The core of the song cycle was well known by the audience. No new surprises. They knew what was coming next. If, if you go to see Rigoletto, if you go, go to see Trovatore and you're a fan of the musical form, you know everything. You're, you're singing along. You're mouthing it. You know the scene. You're elbowing your wife or your partner or your friend to say, oh, I can't wait to hear the sopranos. You know, she's about to sing da-da and, and my favorite aria. And, and they knew the story. Their job was to bring it to life, to embellish the episodes with vivid and dramatic flourishes. And in oral culture, again, this is the thing I was stressing on the previous slide. And in oral culture, this medium elicited total psychological identification in the listeners. Total. It's the only game in town. It carried, if you will, the combined power of religious ritual, art, song, drama, film, and sport. Plato would later describe its power as being rooted in mimesis, mimesis, imitation. The listener is engaged 
and a participatory reenactment. It's sacramental. The epic poem was the essential educational institution of the culture. Our last slide, I'm gonna leave a few minutes so that we can, if there are questions or whatever, uh, on Homer, the ethos of the Iliad, and we're gonna be talking about Homer again when we begin the next session. The ethos of the Iliad. Uh, and I've, I've, I've just listed a series of significant terms that, that personify aspects of the mentality of the, of the audience. There's honor above and beyond all other values. The honor of Achilles has been sullied. And in his rage, the very first word of the Iliad is many. I sing the rage, sing goddess of the rage of Achilles is the first line. But in the Greek, he begins it with the word rage, not goddess, not saying, rage, sing goddess, the rage. He walks off in shame. He's been shamed by Agamemnon, who's taken his spoil of war, the, 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 the maiden, away from him. There's no, he's gonna walk off in shame and sulk, and he's gonna let the Greeks sustain wild reversals. Half of them are going to get killed, but his honor has been sullied. There's no Christian modesty in this world. There's only the glory of victory and posterity's applause. There's honor, there's revenge, there's glory, there's victory. That's it. There's fate, Moira, destiny, the fates, the three sisters. They're part of the fabric of the world. They control life and death. In the Iliad, Zeus is the final set, but barely. He barely, and he has other, he'll have Hera calling him out and saying, you know they're fated. This is fated to happen to them. So back off, big boy. Heroism is performed in the face of fate. Heroism, it's Achilles who knows he must die, he has his famous Achilles heel. He knows he must die. Heroism is what you do knowing what will happen and embracing it. Hubris, excessive pride, but we're challenging the gods, the theoi, the gods from which we get theology, et cetera. And they're remarkably petty or human emotions and passions. They are a jealous tribe, these gods and goddesses. So Agamemnon fits very nicely into this niche, his, his hubristic assumption. I am, I am Agamemnon, king of kings, um, will finally wield his death at the hands of his wife, Clytemnestra. And of course, there is the concept of the acme, the acme. Uh, remember acme products in the Roadrunner cartoons, the acme, the best. Uh, it's the pinnacle of one's life, beyond which it is dangerous to live. Uh, Greek, lots of Greek accounts are filled with admonishments of uh, I know you've just had a good run, but don't gloat, you haven't died yet. There might be a lot of bad news coming, but if you were to die now in the fevered moment of your glory, wouldn't that be wonderful? But the gods are jealous. So there's the famous story told by Herodotus and, and some other places in, in Greek literature of Diagoras of Rhodes. He's the most famous boxer, and he's a real guy. He's the most famous boxer in antiquity. He is the boxing champion in two Olympic games. That's already unbelievable. In the Olympics of 448, during the Greek Golden Age, two of his sons, and later on there were grandsons, 
that were champions. Two of his sons at the same Olympic game, he's in the stands, he's at Olympia, and they are both given olive wreaths for victories and events. They remember in, in the original Olympics, there's only like five events. One in wrestling and the other in the Pankration, which is sort of like the ultimate fight club. Um, they're being crowned the same day. And it's the award ceremony. The Olympic Games would have gone on for five days. They're, it's at the award ceremony. And the sons, and there's a picture of it uh, in the lower right, pick him up onto their shoulders. We are the sons of Diagoras, and they carry him around the arena. And according to the legend, a Spartan in the crowd at that point, realizing that this has to be Diagoras's Acme, it does not get better than this. It cannot get better than this. Calls out, die now. And the crowd takes up the chant, die now. And the Agora still held aloft by his sons in the legend, lowered his head and quietly died. So what we have is the ethos of the Iliad and we will see what Plato has to say about this when we get there. Anyhow, um, I'm going to stop the share and I will remove the pin and you are, if you, you can unmute yourselves if you wanna ask a question or you can use the chat for a question. Um, Okay, we got somebody in chat. That the Indo-Europeans who were in Central Asia, yeah, they were, were the spawners of various civilizations. Who were they? They were they they they, they were these nomadic uh, pastoralists who got everywhere. They were the Greeks. Ultimately, they were the uh, those Indians. They were they were the uh, Italic groups, eventually. Uh, beyond which we can't know much about them. Uh, we know something about their language structures. How did they get started with slaves? I mean, why, you know, you sort of glossed over that. I mean, they just, that was just part of their the culture. They just- It was part of, it was part of every ancient culture. You, you battle, you win, uh, they're yours. So you see in Homer how there were slaves, right? From the very, there would have been slaves from the beginnings in tribal society. We just beat these guys up, mm. now they're ours. And they're treated variously in various cultures. And I will mention, as I've done it in other classes before, ancient slavery has nothing to do with racialism or with, with any, any imputed inferiority of any kind, you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. We won, you lost. So, mm -hmm. so you know, deal with it, you know, kind of thing. And so, were they ever integrated into the society? Did they stay oh, they, they, forever, they, or what happened? Yeah, they were often. Uh, and remember, so for instance, by the time you get to the classical period and then into the Hellenistic period afterwards, um, slaves were often the educated teachers. Of, of wealthy families. They became the pedagogues. So um, the Romans imported Greek slaves as like au pairs to, to teach the kids, you know? Um, I've got questions, let's see. Oh, somebody said, thought that the Medes, uh, Medes were a, a group related, they were probably a Semitic group, nobody's quite sure, um, but they would have been in uh, the Turkish peninsula. And uh, as I said, the readings for 
next week, you know, if you haven't had a chance to look at the um, four or five page excerpt from the book one of the Iliad, that's worth doing just to get the feel for the language. And the pre-Socratics, it's only a few pages of them. And like I said, that would be the weirdest thing you'll have to read all term. Uh, if you decide to read them, we're going to look at those those sections in class and try to make sense of why they were significant because you'll be sitting there wondering why somebody who thought everything was made out of water was a contribution to Western philosophy. <laughs> but, but we will try to make the case. And it is now three. Uh, what's the old commercial? It's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? I will see, oh, any more questions or we'll log off until next week.